Welcome to Jazz Biz 101, where we explore and share our journey as minority entrepreneurs with an emphasis on music business. All right, everyone, welcome back to Jazz Biz 101. This is episode number four, and uh, we are actually here on Zoom, but we're all recording ourselves, but uh, we're here on Zoom with uh, Terrence Say. Is that, that's the Say, right? See, I'm a, such a bad Asian. I have to ask about the <laughs> last names. Um, yeah, it can be whatever you want it to be. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what What is it actually, how, how do you actually pronounce the, well, the last I guess, name I mean, appropriately? It, it, usually we go with like Shay. Shay. Yeah. Ah, okay. All right. But so I've heard go. any number of variations on that and... <laughs> They're all valid because they all look at me when they're like, Terrence, just sue. And I'm like, <laughs> they, yeah, they pronounce the H too heavily. Yeah. Asaya. Asaya. Um, <laughs> hey, but, Terrence, uh, but great to have you, man, on the show. Thanks Thank for you. your time. Thanks for uh, making a little bit of uh, of your you know space in your calendar. We know uh, we're in two different times, uh, three different times. Technically, uh, yeah. Technically, yeah. Um, Right now, I'm, I'm recording from Texas, Peter okay, from Jersey, cool. and you are, you are in Taiwan. That's right. Is that right? Yes. Thanks for having me. Um, it's, it's you know, it's really cool to see what you guys are doing. Wow. It's nice to be number four. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, it's cool to see what you're doing, man. And that's that's why you're here today. And um, yep. just to give the audience a little background, I actually, we met. Or I met uh, Terrence when I was visiting uh, my wife's family um, over in Dongbei area. Uh, but, you know, we went to Beijing for uh, about a couple of days, if not a week. And, um, you know, some of the musicians I asked online, like, who can I connect with so I don't go crazy and want to check out some music? Uh, and they suggested hitting up Terrence. So um, we met over there. And uh, we became good friends since then. Um, and uh, he actually, you know, uh, participated in some of uh, my projects, uh, some of the Final Fantasy trombone stuff. But yeah, uh, <laughs> that'll be a yeah, whole nother discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, but I, I know that uh, Terrence here has been um, heavily involved, not only with the scene in um America here, but uh, really heavily in China as well, which we're going to go into um, today. So welcome, Terrence. Thank you again for being Thanks here. For having me. And, um, you know, before we go too deep into it, um, maybe just give a short rundown of like, you know, your upbringing and, um, you know, how you moved from America to China, you know? Yeah, it's a, it's, uh, let's see. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty wacky story. Like, I grew up in Durham, North Carolina, and, and, you know, Durham, North Carolina is like a, well, I guess technically Chapel Hill, but at the time it wasn't a super, you know, diverse in the aspect. There were like, there weren't that many Asians there. There were some, and, and, uh, and actually there were a lot of randomly like a big Taiwanese community where I grew up. Um, But uh, I I never really spoke the language. I did a little bit of Chinese school. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I did play a lot of music and um, was involved with like, you know, playing piano as every good kind of Chinese kid is, <laughs> um, either violin or piano. My brother got violin, I got piano. Um, <clears throat> and in, in sixth grade, I picked up the trombone in, in concert band. Um, I guess later on, I went to I went to Oberlin um, for school and, and that was kind of at the at the encouraging of, of my teacher Robin Robin Eubanks um, Robin I met Robin at a clinic at uh, one of the like you know honors jazz band clinics in my junior year of high school and Robin um, encouraged me to like uh, try to stick with doing jazz music and I applied to Oberlin not in the conservatory uh, originally with the intent of like impl- applying later if I was interested and if I felt like I was competent enough to, to get there. And I eventually applied in, in, into the conservatory and did my last <clears throat> years at Oberlin as a, as a double degree uh, major. 
And uh, while I was there, I, I, I studied Chinese mostly out of shame <laughs> because I, I don't didn't speak Chinese as a kid. And I was determined that like I was going to learn to speak the language. And as a result, um, I ended up going to, to Beijing in the summer of 2009 um, to, to do like a two month intensive like language program. And oh, wow. when I ended up like my second month there, I, I had my horn with me because you know I, I needed to practice and stuff. <clears throat> and I was like looking up back then in China in 2009, you could still get on Google. So I went on Google and I um, looked up like all the jazz clubs in Beijing, and there was really only like two. One was like the CD Jazz Club, and the other was uh, East Shore. That's like CD, like compact disc, not like CD. A lot of people make that like um, mistake, but uh, so I decided to go to East Shore because they said the Friday night session was like really really cool um the reviews at least so i i went not really like expecting a whole lot and just like my mind was blown because like we had it was like some of the you know some really like amazing musicians were playing that night and they you know it was a, a real like beijing standard band uh, this guy nathaniel gao on saxophone Xia Jia on piano, uh, Zhang Ke on bass, and like uh, Bebe on drums. And that that group just like blew my mind. And, and I kind of ended up like playing hooky for the rest of the program. <laughs> so I was like hanging out with them. And I would, just, I would go to my classes, do the minimum amount of work. And then I like, as soon as like 5 p.m. comes around, I like skip out, you know, and, and go straight to the, uh, you know, hang out with, with the jazz guys, you know, who are now my friends. Um, in, in Beijing and so like by the end of the program everyone was like dude where have you been like the last month <laughs> and so uh, I while I was doing that I, I met a like a a, a banker who uh, essentially you know he arbitrarily you know at, well not arbitrarily but after like hanging out with him for you know a couple of weeks he was like super into he, he's really into trumpet right he really loves the trumpet and um he really loves ryan kaiser so he was going to bring ryan kaiser and willie oh, jones shoot. out to beijing and he asked me he was like right after that like do you want to bring like a group from oberlin to beijing to do a similar kind of like touring situation and i was like not really sure what what to expect I, I thought this maybe this guy's like gonna just like steal my money or something and like run away so I, <laughs> I he was like you know give me your 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 bank information and i'm like why are you money for like plane plane tickets and i was like uh, oh, that's a bad sketch all right so I, get, I gave him my like lorraine county credit union like bank account which has like 32 dollars it being figuring like <laughs> takes 32 dollars it's like no you know <laughs> no harm there like I can go you know whatever <laughs> and next morning I woke up and I had I, he had like wired me all the money I needed to buy plane tickets to like get a band to to come to Beijing and I was like oh shit this is actually happening <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that's crazy I, I, brought, I put together like six guys um <clears throat> including myself from like Oberlin from the jazz program and we did like a five-week tour of, of sort of of like Beijing and Shanghai um, and just hung out for like five weeks and they were, you know, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty epic, like doing that. And I did that three or four more years, um, with different times. I got, you know, financial support from different organizations, not always, him, right? but he was the kind of one who kickstarted it. And then, um, when I graduated, I kind of decided, well, it's either New York or I can go to Beijing. And if I go to New York, I'm really going to have to just completely start over again. Um, so why not just go to Beijing and see if I can hack it there? Ah, uh, I see. And so yeah. I graduated in May mm -hmm. and October 30th, I moved, you know, I, I took this summer to work, save up a little bit of money. And then October 30th, I like bought my plane ticket, one way ticket out of, uh, out of North Carolina, Raleigh, Durham. And, uh, and I've, you know, it's not like I haven't been back, but like, you know, I've been based in, in Beijing and in Asia since, ever since. Wow. 
dude, that's crazy. <laughs> so you established those relationships, um, you know, heavily in Beijing during your time at Oberlin because of that overseas um, program, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gave me the chance to, you know, almost not pass my language course, but <laughs> <laughs> it also like gave me the opportunity to meet some musicians and to build some connections with them and, um, and, and to have just like a, to be involved in a community, um, which I was frankly like really concerned about trying to do when I moved, if I tried to move to New York. Um, mm, right. I, I think everybody is really scared of moving to New York before they, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> before they do like as college students, are like, well, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to survive? Yeah. Yeah. That makes yeah. a lot of sense for sure. Um, yeah. so when, so when you moved to, um, Beijing, what were you doing heavily at first in order to, uh, sustain yourself over there? You know, and one way ticket, that's pretty scary. That means, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, at first I didn't that really means. have an idea. Um, I, I had this idea that I wanted to do music part-time, just like play gigs and have a desk job, you know, doing something, in 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 china maybe like a writing gig or you know and, and essentially that's what i did for the first year while i was there i worked at a, a bilingual culture magazine um oh. called the world of chinese i was an i started off as an intern there because they didn't have an editor position officially open yet but i essentially did all the the, the, the duties of being an editor and uh ended up being a full-time editor there. And I kind of realized about, you know, a year in that like the nine to five thing was cool, but it wasn't something I really wanted to do. And I really yeah. wanted to like take a chance and see if I could actually do the music thing full time instead. Uh, yeah. So I quit the nine to five and then started, you know, just booking gigs and stuff, you know, small $50 gigs here and there and the occasional little bit of commercial work and you can find it. Right. And there's been a bit of a bit of a road from there to where I am now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. We'll have to, uh, you know, piece by piece get, get there. But um, I, I'm wondering, I think a lot yeah. of uh, people don't know what it's like to be an Asian American and then go to China where a lot of people look like you, but then you don't necessarily, you know, fit in a hundred percent. You know what I mean? Like they kind of look at right. you still as uh uh Meg and, and or whatever, right. you know? And it's just like, <laughs> that's, yeah, that, yeah. that might be, you know, how, how was that experience? I guess like um moving into a space where, yeah, like, you know, people just go like, oh, they assume that you're from there, but you're really from America. But then you also are Chinese. Well, like. yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of, I kind of welcome that actually. I mean, I, I know a lot of people and makes, it makes, you know, a, I'm, I'm really different in that respect. I think a, a lot of people find that experience like really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, and for many different reasons, I think it depends on your gender because the stereotypes mm -hmm. on your gender are different. Right. Um, right. <clears throat> I, I, I kind of felt this, huge I don't know I, I felt it was like very like this this very uh liberating experience to like know that like if I was walking down the street like people aren't gonna like yell shit at me you know mm. yeah you know or judge me based on like what they, I look like when I moved to China I just realized that like if I don't say anything because at that time, my Chinese wasn't like that great. <laughs> right. I don't say anything. Like people are just going to assume that I'm one of them, which was like a super liberating feeling. Just like well, mm -hmm. get on a bus, put your hat down and realize like you're just part of the crowd. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. You're not going to be treated differently just based yeah. off of something you can't necessarily control, which is your look. Exactly. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it was it was really cool for me. Did, did, you, did you feel more confident about going out and networking because of that reason or like you know what i mean like was it a little easier to just be like hey i'm going to do this thing now without well certainly there's like the language barrier that didn't make me feel more confident at the beginning um and still mm -hmm. like and, and not just i mean 
with the language barrier, there's also a cultural barrier. And, um, you know, the way that we think about doing things, talking to people about issues and, you know, how we come to like a mutual understanding about things is different between, you know, American culture and, and Chinese culture. So that definitely um, played a huge role in like my, you know, anxiety about um, being an independent musician in China. But at the same time, I knew that I had, you know, a community that I built throughout my college years and had invested in um, quite a lot. Um, and that I kind of had this hope that the community would at least kind of help to look over, look after me a little bit as well. Um, and yeah, I, I had a huge amount of support when I first moved there. Like I crashed on Nathaniel's couch for like a month and he like, <laughs> He he uh, he went back to the states, I think, for like two months, and so I, I just I stayed at his place from like October until like January, <laughs> and I you know I didn't have, he didn't make me pay rent either. He was just like take wow, care of my nice. my my place, like make sure the roof doesn't leak and like <laughs> water the plants, you know. Um, that's it was, awesome. It was really awesome. Yeah, yeah that's really nice. Awesome. Nice to have that. Um, uh, support and I think yeah. hospitality is, is definitely probably different too and totally, culturally yeah. <laughs> you know yeah I, um, I think there's a different time in the scene too where everybody was kind of thinking like oh like somebody new here is in the scene now it's like awesome like let's just hang out with them all the time like you know mm. the un- mm. scene in Beijing up until maybe like three years ago was pretty I mean has was like underground beyond underground like it barely even qualifies as a scene. It's like <laughs> on the fringe of the fringe, wow. you know. So nobody even advertises their gigs up until like a couple of years ago. Like it was just the weekly East Shore gig, the weekly CD Jazz gig, and people knew of these people and they were you know well known within circles, but they never really, you know, there was never any like outward acknowledgement that we had a Beijing jazz scene. So. Mm-hmm. It was wow. a small, close knit community of of guys who were really, you know, just interested in, like, you know, their their, their swim lane was very narrow, but they also just they like, hung out with each other, and it was they're very Chinese. Like the jazz musicians <laughs> who moved to China are like they speak the language, right? Like, a lot of them end up like speaking very good Chinese. And they end up picking up a lot of like Chinese cultural isms. So like, it, it's very interesting in that regard. Like mm. the, the scene kind of has like a very unique, like Chinese culture characteristic to it. Not necessarily the music, but like the, the way that the people interact with each other. Um, mm. uh, very, very cool. Yeah. Okay. They're like yeah. locals, yeah. become locals. <laughs> Man, you, you mentioned that uh, that the scene, um, you know, um, as you got there, the scene was, uh, uh, and as you were still developing there, your music and your career, still growing, right? What what about the what about the audience that that come out to listen? It's, is there what about the clubs? What about the spaces that uh, is that is almost kind of like in the same level as the scene is growing and expanding or? Uh, what's the feel of people coming out listening to his music? Did they is uh, they're receptive and all that? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I'd say the most um, the most famous jazz club in Beijing, or maybe not famous, but the most well known for sure, like and respected jazz club in 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 really actually in China. That's only a jazz club. It's called <laughs> East Shore, and it really yeah, feels there. small, like. Um, yeah, it's it's it it really is like the same kind of decor. Uh, <laughs> yep, and I feel that way. Um, yeah, you you've been there, right? Yeah, Peter? I've been there. It, it it feels like smalls backwards because the bar is on the left hand side. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the audience yeah. is on the right, but it's all packed in. You have nowhere to s- sit. Um, yeah, it was it was really packed when I was there, and the people were like super yeah. respective of the music. Yeah, the atmosphere you know? is is really cool. You can play, you know, the owners will never like tell you like you can't pl- what you can't play there or like anything. That's cool. Um, and and there's a regular bands that play, you know, throughout mm-hmm. the week there. Um, 
yeah and it, it's just this like it has this kind of revered it's like this hallowed space mm. um between the musicians and, and and the relationship between the club and the musicians is really special in that, in that sense that mm-hmm. everybody just loves to play there because there's this magic you know there that you really don't i haven't seen many other places you know even in the world you know like it just has this like this this vibe the stink in the air you know <laughs> <laughs> you smell yeah. the cigarettes from like you know right years years and years ago still like clinging to the walls <laughs> yeah the smoke and it's just it's just dank it's, in there <laughs> <laughs> So, so how did you, um, you know, really get connected? Maybe you could explain your your path as a musician over there. Like, um, where you hang out a lot at these jam sessions, and you know, you know, you started doing gigs from basically making these connections. Like, how was it like, kind of getting in? So I was doing a lot of. I guess there's a couple different, <laughs> yeah, like paths I was walking at the same time. Um, you know, for two or three years I was, just, or for, I guess for, you know, really like two years, I was just doing the circuit like everybody else, like playing, playing the gigs. I picked up a teaching job <clears throat> at one of the international schools um, <clears throat> as the sort of like jazz band director of uh, one of the K, the, the K through 12 uh, program at, um, at the international school of Beijing. And I was doing that uh, for the middle school and high school program, and and they had a big band, so I was working with the big with their big band, like putting music, you know, giving them music, you know, re- rehearsing the band, doing the concerts and everything. That was sort of a part time gig that I did once or twice a week. Um, and so I guess one path that ended up opening for me was um, the Blue Note Beijing Jazz Orchestra from that nice and uh having done you know a number of big bands in the past um and then you know working a lot with with high school big band i guess <laughs> how that shows you how little like big band <laughs> experience anybody has in Beijing. <laughs> they came to me and asked <laughs> 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 So I was like, oh, sure, all right, you know. Um, and yeah, it was cool. It was a huge learning opportunity, right? Like, yeah, you're the expert <laughs> over there, right? Yeah. That's how much- <laughs> no, I, I don't know, necessarily know if I was an expert, but I was definitely the one with the organizational skills, right? Like that—that uh-huh. that is one thing I did have, and like the organizational skills to put together a band. So, and as everybody knows who's ever tried to run a big band, is it's like it's a it's a shit show, right? Like, oh yeah, oh um, all the time. You can you can bleep that out if you need, but no, uh, no, this is uh, yeah, no, no, this we're not this is, we're not a this is for box. adults. <laughs> it's a bleep bleep, right? <laughs> um, it, I mean, it's a shit show. Like, not only are you running, you know, a bunch of hurting a bunch of cats, literally a bunch of it's like hurting cats, right? But you know, the Blue Note is an institution that has to make money, and so. You know, as the director and as, as the person who kind of was in between the band, you know, put myself in between the band and the institution deliberately, um, it, 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 you know, you, you have to like manage up and down. So there's very little wiggle room for you as a, as a leader, you know, as a manager, like you have to take responsibility for both sides of the equation. Mm. And, and was the was the blue note uh, connected to the blue note here in New York City, or how's that work? Is it just a so entity? technically they are technically well, oh, actually technically they aren't, but um, they have the blessing of the the, the blue note in New York. Mm. Um, essentially, the way kind of the the way companies work, you know, corporate law works in China is that. Uh, a franchise cannot open, like an, an international franchise cannot directly open a company in China. Oh. You have a local partner to run the franchise. So Blue Note essentially franchised off their the rights to what they call Greater China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and, and China, 
to uh, to a a businessman in 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 Beijing, um, and he opened the first uh, Beijing Blue Note or Blue Note Beijing. Uh, so it is tech. It is like spiritually connected to the brewery in new york <laughs> right but technically right. they're they're two different organizations oh wow yeah. okay that that becomes more clear to me now because there is a yeah. blue note in you know <laughs> taiwan right. and yeah for sure right um, and, and the interesting thing about the blue note in taiwan is there was like definitely a lawsuit to try and get the, the blue note taiwan to change about name. this <laughs> But the Blue Note Taiwan existed before the Blue Note New York existed. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> because because yeah. it's all like a giant like marketing scheme, right? Like the Blue Note New York, the Blue Note group is actually not related to the Blue Note record label. Right. That's right. But right. they're actually, this is an entertainment company. Uh, I forget who runs, who the parent entertainment company is, but the Blue Note record label is under Universal. Under Universal. Um, and Universal is is has nothing to do with this with the clubs this entertainment oh, club company. I see. So I see. The clubs were definitely trying to use the 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 you know the allure of Blue Note Records when they created their 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 club. Right. Um, right. Right. But that was in the eighties, right? I believe it was in the late eighties when the Blue Note uh, New York like began. And the Blue Note Taipei was actually like in like seventy something, so it predated <laughs> it by quite a while. Um, so they, they didn't they didn't win the loss. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> That's freaking hilarious. Uh, but yeah, so you know, being so you were the artistic director of the Blue Note yeah. Beijing Jazz Orchestra specifically, right? Yes, and and that in, entails just basically being <sighs> everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, doing everything. Yeah. Musician, right? Man, how did that t- right? How did that work out? Uh, you, did you uh, did you have to uh, really get to meet the community of musicians, or did they already have a a roster of musicians that, or do you have the liberty to say, you know what, I want this guy to be on on this chair, or, or you know what I mean? What what? Yeah, the- <clears throat> that was that was my. Primarily, what I did was I assigned everybody their chairs. Oh, nice! Uh, so, so you had to I, you had to meet the community of musicians. I mean, you 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 didn't become the the jazz orchestra director right away, right? You you, you no, yeah. It took. I was it was I was probably that was probably five years in twenty four four or five years in. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I moved in in twenty twelve. I think it was like twenty seventeen when they. Late 2016, when they came found me, um, so I, I pretty much knew everybody at that point right. in the Beijing scene. Right, and then you would um, book um, special guests, right? Because I would see like these yeah. videos with like Conrad, right? You yeah, Conrad yeah, over there. Nice. Yeah, um, we, we had this. We had this like idea that you know I had this idea that um, we would do like a master series. So it's it wasn't called the master series. I had, they called it the master series, but my idea was that. <laughs> not that these guys aren't masters, but it's just like, I, I, it just sounds like so pretentious. Um, <laughs> like <laughs> I had this idea that we would like make um, a show maybe once or twice a year, but we would have the blue note, you know, play with somebody who is going to be in town, you know, for one of their own shows. Oh. Um, and Originally, it was we wanted to kind of have those, you know, artists who come in and see who who would be willing to like do a night beforehand with with the big band. But I think there were some contractual issues; they don't want to cannibalize their audience and stuff. So they were just like, "All right, so whoever you want, just let us know, and we'll reach out to them and see whether they're interested." And so I I kind of went through, you know, the first one that we had was it was a new year's show and i i figured like it's a good time to pitch in as a new year's show like people will buy the tickets you know you'll make mm-hmm. they'll make their fair share of money and i'm sure like any artist that would be from the states is going to be a lot more expensive than what we charge you know here so if we can get like a a, a big event show then we can probably bring in you know some big shot so i kind of brought it up you know I, I went through a list and i was like oh what if we got mark turner 
<laughs> and and I was like, what about Mark Turner? They were like, mm, let's ask. And the day back, a day later, the the coordinator got back to me. She was like, yeah, Mark's down. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> that's when it kind of hit me. I was like, oh my god and now i was like okay well, what are you gonna play and she was like well that's up to you and i was like wouldn't it be kind of cool if like mark did that whole like joe henderson book you know from big band ah uh, yeah what if we got him as a guest soloist because that's kind of what big band does for joe and so i was like well i don't have all the charts they're not commercially available so and we're short of trumpet players, so why don't we ask like Mike Mossman to come too? Because Mike did like four or five of those arrangements on that album. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Makes sense. That's right. Yeah, and slide did the other ones, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, he did two of the other ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so uh, they reached out to him, and he was down. Of course, he was down as well. And uh, and so yeah, we we had a New Year's concert with the Blue Note Beijing Jazz Orchestra featuring. Mark Turner and Michael Mossman, which was just nuts. <laughs> Playing that nuts. music. Yeah, that's oh, that's yeah. insane. That's some like, good arranging too. Yeah. Mark took I think he took like 18 choruses of Con Alma or something like that. Oh, shoot. That that's <laughs> like, a slice was, arrangement, right? A Con Alma, is that right? Well, no, no, the Con that, Alma no. that we did no. was actually Mike Mossman's arrangement. Oh. Yeah. Um he, he did his own like Latin arrangement, but the other one that he did, he like recorded me. He took like, like yeah, he did that one. Yeah. sixteen, you know, fourteen courses on of recorded me too, or something like that. So it was it was crazy enough that like Kevin, a couple of those solos, Kevin so, some like recorded, he transcribed them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was like nobody ever hears Mark Turner play standards. Like that's right. Yeah, days. wow. It's very rare that you'll hear him play standards. Wow, that's you know, very like, unique, especially ones yeah. like. Con album or like record me and stuff like that. Yeah, so, yeah, that's totally different. Wow. <laughs> invitation. Wow. That's the one. He took like 13 courses of invitation. Wow. Um, Damn. It was like, that's wow. amazing, dude. Uh, so did he and have he to arrange? He never himself. A, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, did, did he have to arrange anything for the um, I, orchestra? I did stuff? an arrangement. I, I wrote, I actually wrote a song um, and I had him, I had him play on it. Um, wow! Yeah, that's so, so cool. He, nice. he played my song, <laughs> um, nice, man. and we had a bunch of more artists after that. Like, uh, who else? We had Jaleel Shaw the year after that. Nice. Jaleel was amazing. I, I also did one of Jaleel's songs. He has a big band book of his oh. his own music. That's um, right, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Conrad that winter. Um, and they've, they've kept going, right? Like they had, uh, you know, I left in 20, 20, 20, late 2018 and, uh, they, they, they've been going, you know, last year they had Rudresh Mahanthapa. Yeah. Nice. And, uh, yeah. the year before Chris Davis, um, nice. And they've just nice. kind of kept going, you know, Kevin's the director now. So, oh, Kevin. Kevin Sun. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. He oh. flies in or wow. was flying in like once every two months to like wow. do the big man. Whoa. I yes. did not know that. Oh, That's yeah. That's crazy. He took over. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Man, I, um, I, I find it very interesting uh, how you sharing the. Uh, how things, how you made things work, and and just uh, you know, as we were talking to uh, one of our guests uh, on our podcast, uh, we talk about the business side of things, and you, how you mentioned that that uh, yeah, it was really cool to have the band at your disposal and to talk about the music, but you were also thinking about like how the club needed to make money and That's how right. you thought about like if we do it in a New Year's Eve, it will work out for everyone. Is that when they doing it like regularly just once a year kind of thing, a New Year's Eve kind of Yeah, once or once or twice. So we 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 did our main like Mark was on New Year. Mark and Mike were on a New Year's. Um Jaleel was on like the anniversary of the band. Mm. So the the one year anniversary of the band we had oh, a perfect. special show. And so we, I invited Julio because Julio has been like a hero of mine. And to have him there was, was awesome. Man, to do his music. You started this thing, right? Like bringing the guest and. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. Really cool. More or less. <laughs> <laughs> he gave musicians work, man. That's what's <laughs> up, man. That's really nice. I mean, the thing was like, 
like from from the standpoint and the thing is i i I don't want it to make it look like i'm like well i mean the thing about a club is like obviously like for and for a club of that size if you see the blue note beijing like you'll realize like what kind of ridiculous rent they're paying um and by ridiculous i mean it's insane like they're in the former compound of the u.s embassy they basically dug out the the courtyard and like put a basement enormous basement complex that can fit like 300 people oh, wow. in um, yeah, so it's, it's a huge, huge room it's, huge. it's like a bunker it's literally a bunker mm-hmm. you know with an auditorium in it um <laughs> it doesn't count as a club anymore i think yeah it doesn't really, <laughs> it doesn't really feel like a club it feels like a theater like a mini theater oh, right wow. yeah so you know cl- venues want to make money and they want to like limit their their expenses so you really have to like always kind of think about and i'm not saying you always have to to like give into these demands but you have to think about like how am i going to like word something that makes it feel them feel like they're getting something out of it right um that Mm -hmm. that that benefits their bottom line um and that's that's like a that's a definitely music director skill. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah you got to think like that. Sell it to everybody. You have to yeah. sell it to your guys. You have to know that sell them artistically. Like, you know, you have to tell them like, okay, we're going to play this killing show with this killing artist. And if usually that's enough, they'll be like, all right, that's, this is awesome. But with a club, you tell them, oh, we're going to have this killing artist to be like, so what? Exactly. Like, <laughs> don't care. Like, is he going to sell tickets or not? You know? <laughs> yeah. And, yep. and they care less. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I'm sure you guys have you guys have yeah. like had this thing in New York too. You're like, we're gonna play with this guy, and they're like, who the is exactly. that? You know, exactly. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> more tickets. I don't care. And yeah, you know, and I got to the, I had to be like, all right, Mark Turner is gonna play with us. I guarantee you, like, you're gonna be like 75 percent full, you know, that night at mm. least. Um, and they're like, all right, well. What do you you know? What are you willing to bet on? I was like nothing, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure you got be full. <laughs> yeah, jazz seventy five percent, which is <laughs> more like a twenty percent. The, the little seats on the side, right? Those were those were those were full. Right, right. Um, <laughs> no, it was I, it was a packed show. Like they sold out. They had a line going out the door that they couldn't. Oh wow, nice! Oh, that's amazing. Uh, I bet they couldn't happy. seat everybody. <laughs> they were happy with you uh-huh. with your decision you should yeah bet, you should bet something man you should have you should, you're right <laughs> put in some money with that well i, I remember I when you know well i'm not gonna say you know when i left it was it was definitely a change in in attendance levels oh. <laughs> <laughs> yay owner, i remember hearing through the grapevine that he was like why is there a change in attendance levels? <laughs> You're like, I know why. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I, I hold the you. secret. <laughs> I'll um, tell you something. I'll tell you some something. <laughs> well, that, that's amazing for people to hear about. Um, yeah, that's a whole <laughs> other scene, you know, yeah. that like people are not aware of. And right. That's super cool that you start bringing, you know, like these artists over there. Um, now, one of the things that I was really interested in and, um, was you know you getting involved in the commercial world in, in mm. China and yeah. you know there's a lot of um, you know like my wife is from China she knows all the singers I'm just <laughs> looking at the list I'm like who's right. that who's that but <laughs> like these are really famous like singers over in China and there's like kind of um, a show that she watches that's kind of similar to like the voice here and yeah. so you actually is it so you are the um you put together horns for for that stuff, right? Or how, how's that? What's your function with? Which which show are you talking about? I don't know. <laughs> it just looks like the voice in China. I'm like, yeah. oh, this um, this is interesting. Well, I am a singer. I, I that's that's actually the first gig I where I got my start. Um, I I uh, I don't. I wasn't. In, I was just a session guy. Like I don't actually like coordinate that big. But um, okay, that one the the horns coordinator is a. Well, the horn, the horns leader section leader is a, a, you know, kind of my. I guess in Chinese we would say Chen Bei, like my like, you know, uh, it was like, not not like Shifu, but like you know, the guy, the guy, my respected like elder, 
you know, mm. he's like my respect elder. He's a, he's actually a Canadian guy, uh, and he he's been living in Hong Kong for like the last twenty, probably more, twenty five years maybe. Uh-huh. Um, and he he is a sax player and a commercial music, uh, you know, arranger and composer, mm. and he kind of gave me my shot at being on this show and you know my first kind of introduction to doing commercial music um, in that setting and so he's he's his name is charlie huntley um and he's a you know great guy an incredibly exacting musician like he knows mm. exactly what he wants out of you mm. and uh not willing to like you know tell you off until he gets it <laughs> Um, as you should, you know, like commercial music is is incredibly like requires precision, you know, yeah. it's a precision game, um, and that's and so that you know that's where I got in that show with him, and then later on, once I started branching out and working with different artists and, and different musicians, um, kind of found my carved out my own little piece of the pie. I guess. <laughs> right. The, like being a session <laughs> player is what you're talking about. Yeah. Like, yeah, okay. yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah. Man, those productions are are huge though. I mean, like <laughs> they're massive. They're massive. I, I have, I have some crazy stories about some of those productions, man. <laughs> I, I can tell you if you want. Well, <laughs> maybe share one, <laughs> share okay. one, one of your favorite ones. <laughs> the most ridiculous one, and I'm not going to say which one this is or who this is for because I, I don't want to get in trouble here, but there was one that <laughs> we had. It, it was literally, we would go on, on, it was like two, three days of rehearsal. One day of, this is the first day is about a normal, like eight to 10 hour rehearsal. Right. Uh, with, with the artists. Day two is we go in at 12 a.m. or 12 p.m. right at noon. And we come out usually around like six or seven a.m. the next morning. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> what? Jeez. Yeah, like sixteen hours. Are you even like, like functional after? <laughs> you you really like, yeah, it is. It's brutal. So you you go in, it's like midday, and you come out, and the sun's coming up the next day. And you're like, oh, wow, why am I here? <laughs> that's that, that's working yeah. hard. Shoot. Yeah. Well, it wasn't really working hard. That's the thing. Like for that, it was. There's a lot of sitting around because there's a lot of setups and stuff. The production was super involved, but yeah, it's quite like a. It was. It was quite difficult. You know, I mean, it's difficult to concentrate, even if you have something really simple to play. Like after about fourteen or fifteen hours, like everything's just can't keep track of like rests anymore. You know, three bars of rest. Like, oh, right. Where are we? Oh, right. oh, I missed it. You know, <laughs> like, how many measures? Oh, oh, there it goes. Yeah, yeah, literally, literally, you're like counting. You're counting with a click. You're like, oh, oh. yeah. You know, and you're not off, and you're like, but well, yeah, it pays I mean, off though, because I mean, on on those productions, I mean, good, it's just right? it's yeah, it sounds good. Yeah, like yeah, it's not everyone's really yeah. Uh, my my wife actually was watching a show one time, and she's like, "Is that Terrence?" I was like, wait, what do you mean? And I looked and it was like, yeah, you were like in the horn section. I was like, what the heck? That's so cool. Man. Yeah. Man. She was like, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. It's, it's cool that people like recognize me. Yeah, it is. It's, it's cool and it's freaky at sometimes. Because like I'll get people on like WeChat. You know, WeChat is the Chinese mm-hmm. like WhatsApp that we have. Yeah. And like people that I've never, I've had like maybe one conversation with. And they always think it's really clever to like send me a picture if they see me on TV and I have to remember like who they are. I'm like, who were you again? Like, <laughs> right. thanks. <laughs> like, I'm glad you remember me, but like, I don't remember who you are. Usually it's like some kind of gig who I met somewhere. Like they just wanted to say hello and add in my WeChat. And then like, I get like a picture of like, it's oh, something like randomly they're like, and they don't even say anything. Just send me the picture, you know? Yeah. I'm like, don't do that yeah. to Terrence is what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> Stop doing that. Well, I don't know you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If I've spoken once, like, yeah, that's, I mean, if we're good friends and you send me a picture, it's not uh, good you etiquette. Know, of course, like it's not a problem. But <laughs> then I have to go through the whole rigmarole trying to figure out like where I met you, right. you know, in this like, yeah. way, you know, right. huge expenditure of mental energy, but mm-hmm. whatever. That's, that's not a, that's not a real problem. That's, that's a, <laughs> 
man um i <laughs> i can i can relate a little bit to i i had you know i've had uh, been uh you know uh in a couple of those uh productions more like a you know as a as a live performance uh, where you just have to yeah. you know uh you know it's like three days rehearsal and you have to stay there it's like a whole day right. thing um yeah you know my my um I, I know you you're a, a really good producer and uh you know um uh, could you could you talk about if there's anything I, like i remember being in those some of those rehearsals for those productions i've been part of and i always just remember just kind of checking out how things are running even though sometimes like you said you know like it's like man i'm sitting around i could just be at home doing something <laughs> editing you know or right. i don't know right but but then also at certain points just i remember checking out the you know the md and just be like oh damn check out this guy he's keeping things yeah. cool he's bringing in right. you know like i've had a chance to play a bunch with uh, ray chu who's the music director for dancing with the stars and oh you know, killing and all of these shows and i've been amazed about how he just keeps cool how do you, it have you had experiences like that like learning from like mds or uh, how Absolutely. can you talk about that yeah man that's really cool that you bring that up because that's i think it's a huge part of honestly like who your md is and how you and your relationship with them is incredibly important to like how you succeed as a musician mm. and it really a lot of it also comes down to like mm. how cool a person they are um you know the the commercial music business is, is is it's brutal you know it's like we are like disposable plastic forks you know they just throw <laughs> us away as soon as like <laughs> as soon as as soon as one of us doesn't become useful anymore right. and so really what i have always found is that you know you 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 have a a person that you follow right you're not necessarily following the artist you follow the music director mm -hmm. um and the music mm -hmm. director is, is exactly like you said the guy who keeps it cool he keeps it all together he's the guy who like in, when the situation gets like crazy uh when it gets like things are getting on on you know it's, we're on thin ice here he's the one who like keeps everybody in their spot like if the, if somebody gets off a little bit he'll pull the you know make sure that the click is re-coordinated and everything um for those of you who don't know what the click is it's the click track right mm -hmm. um and that's run by a separate guy oftentimes or or him um if he's if they don't have a separate programmer for mm -hmm. for the for the the backing track that we all play yeah. with mm -hmm. um yeah man like being a music director really requires like an amount of like confidence but and musical musicality um and attention to detail that like you know most people don't have mm -hmm. that kind of work skill but also people skill because they have to be able to liaise with yeah. not just the artist but the management with the band, you know, they have to have some financial literacy because a lot of times their their side is going to be handling a lot of the, you know, the the money and making sure people are getting paid and stuff. Um, music, obviously musicality, because they have to know all the tracks better than the singer yeah. herself or him right. herself. Like They have to be able That's to true. predict, you know, <laughs> knowing if the artist is going to screw up, where they're more like prone to screwing up you know, than, than, than the artists themselves. So they right. have to be able to like read somebody's mind before they even get there. Mm -hmm. um, things like key changes, you know, stuff. It's, it's just, it's, it's crazy. You know, like I was just talking to my, my buddy Fergus, who's, you know, um, tonight he's in Gaucho and I'm going to go down tomorrow to check out the show. Um, he's, he's a, he's a MD currently for Alin. Ah, okay. And, mm -hmm. Uh, who's like a famous Taiwanese yep. pop star. Um, and, you know, he's, I, I talk to him all the time about this and he's just like, it's so much stress. Um, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> and he's like an inherently very nervous dude, but he's also like a monster bass player um, and key, and a keyboard player. So he, he really has like this, he, he so he, he, he grew up in Toronto and he kind of came up playing with um, Larnell Lewis. 
in back in Toronto. So his bass chops are like he's got he's got the gospel bass chops neo soul stuff keyboard. He's an amazing keyboard player and and producer as well. And you know he, and he's like you know kind of shitting himself every before every gig. Like I can yeah. see him like wringing <laughs> hands and stuff. And you know it's it's not an easy job, um, and it's not one that I like envy. And it's it's one that I hate doing every time I have to do it too. Right? It's like, is yeah. it is it worth it? I don't know. <laughs> but but we but we get stuck doing it sometimes. Like there's not there's not really like any. Yeah, there's like you know you you just it's it's a job we got to do. Somebody's got to do it. If you're capable mm. of doing it, so like. You, you get dirty and you do the work, you know. <laughs> yeah. You gotta get paid good, right? That's yeah, exactly. Sure. Yeah, pay's not bad. Pay's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of uh producing, you know, um, I think that's a good segue into yeah. um your newest album. Can you Ooh, and oh, yeah. uh well let's talk <laughs> about the group first, right? Um Spice yeah. Cabinet, but that's the American translation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Well, let's- yeah, it is. We yeah. talked about this before. <laughs> right. Um, you, so the Spice Cabinet was a group that I played in Oberlin, actually, mm-hmm. a oh. couple of times. I had the, the pleasure of playing in it a few times. Actually, it wasn't my group. It was somebody else's. Oh, and when okay. I opened bands with like silly names. So one of them was the Spice Cabinet. There was another one called Justice Coin. Um, <laughs> nice. Uh, you gotta bring I'm them. Oh, there's no, yeah, right. There's there's another there's a band run. Uh, there's a funk band called Funkin' Donuts. Um, <laughs> and it was just it was like you know it was it was fun. Like those were the kinds of gigs where we just played in basements and we just like played kind of raw hip hop covers oh, until yeah. like the Classic. floors just like creak and everybody's like sweating and you're not sure whether the floor is going to cave in or not. Classic, um, classic, man. <laughs> yeah. And totally instrumental too. So when I moved to Beijing, I kind of wanted to do something similar because I thought that Beijing might have like a, an okay vibe for like, for doing this kind of thing as well. But I realized I was going to have to like change it around a little bit. I couldn't just, we don't have a similar like musical lexicon that like they, I can't just call like, you know, some, some like, Bass player, you know, yeah, I, or but I can't just call some like hip hop joint off the top of my head, and, like mm. you know, uh, and people and, know like, it bad yeah. words for life or something, and then expect them to know it. Like they're not gonna, oh, they're not gonna be able to like know that one. You know? The repertoire, so, yeah, is different. Yeah. yeah, the repertoire is 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 not the same. So I, I kind of started having to arrange things, and they got a little bit more and more involved as I started to grow the band. I started to add more horns. And then I moved off trombone and actually started playing keys oh, nice. in the band, so I could be, have a little more control of 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 harmony and, and the elements. And, <laughs> that uh, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and it sort of turned just morphed into this thing where we would play. You know, the the bar that we play at Modernista, like they would give us the Friday night slot, and it's like Friday night slots are usually for like you know a serious like pop band or a band that brings in like pretty serious acts and mm-hmm. you know, we probably pulled in like over the course of the night like 300 plus people you know? wow whoa nice. just like <laughs> they're just like going crazy at like 2 a.m i'm just like, all right guys we gotta stop this is like, instrumental dead, right you know? this is all instrumental yeah instrumental, totally instrumental wow. we're playing like pop covers so uh, I, I would do like top 40 stuff and i would just arrange it you know in a way that's a, a little bit less like avant-garde right. i guess <laughs> <laughs> to put it nicely uh you know with a, a full chart and everything and, and nice. we would like big big like chunky solo sections but you put a dance beat on it and you i'm still putting like funky like weird jazz changes but with <laughs> like a backbeat on it and it's like more than a backbeat but but it's you know it, it people are dancing to it and the musicians are still having fun playing too. And it's, it's just like, wow, there's, we actually sort of found a happy, like medium, cross yeah, between medium, yeah. pop and jazz. You know? That's really cool. Wow. Yeah. So you almost educated like a scene too, in a way, right? <laughs> like where it's like, okay, we're going to play these, these tunes and you're going to learn it. And like, 
right? Or was it a combination <laughs> of also bringing people over? Because I see there's some, yeah, there's some other yeah, people we, in your band you know, too, when right? People, when people come over, they would guest, you know, with us, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, these weren't really so much like, lead sheets i was writing so much as like full-blown charts you know like i have charts wow. so everybody's got a book and they bring it you know to the gig and stuff and i've at this point i've probably closer to 50 or 60 charts oh, nice. that i did oh shoot um yeah i used to do like one a, one, a, one a month two a month you know or something like that just just for the hell of it um yeah and so that's kind of where the band started and where it is now is is a totally different place now. Um, you know, we got to this point where, like, the where where I was just asking myself, like, well, you know, we we like this venue, but if it closes, like, it's really hard for us to find a space that's gonna be a home for us. You know, because like this is a very special place with a very special audience that like goes crazy when we play jazz, you know, and it's, I don't think you're going to find that anywhere else. So the, you know, the, the thing, the next thing that fell in my lap was, you know, my boss, Arai, who basically called me up one day and said, hey, he's, he's my music director on for Karen Mock. Mm. Um, I mean, I've been playing in her band on her tour and he's the drummer and the, and the music director for that group as well. But he his he has his own label in China called Eleven's Music, and okay. they had recently right. just signed a two year kind of. They they hadn't forfeited everything, but they were doing a two year kind of contract deal with Universal, mm. um, and Arai basically approached me. He said, "You know, I know you put out an album of covers like last year, but if you have any original music." that you want to put out, like we'd be interested in bundling you and a couple of other musicians together into like a package for universal, like a, a Chinese jazz series for them. Oh, um, I see. Of albums. Yeah. Oh, wow. And that's, that's how this new album came about. Yeah. So that's how this new album came oh, out. Yeah. I thought to myself, well, I've got the one song that I did last year and one song from many years ago that I was originally was a, a talk show kind of comedy talk show host theme that I had done that I had just, the, the, the show got canceled. So I just took my theme song back. I was like, yeah, fuck it. Like, mine. <laughs> give me back my you know, song. Yeah, right, give me back. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> give me that. <laughs> um, so I did that. I had those two and I was thinking to myself like, well, what, what else could I do? And, and, and this was, this was in November. He brought up the idea. So I kind of thought about it for a while and he was like, you know, I just want you to think about it because I'm still trying to get it solidified on my side. And then we were stuck here. He was stuck here for a long time too in up until May. And so in Jan in, in February, when I got to Taiwan, he was like, yo man, like uh, let's go out for dinner one night. Uh, um, and so we went to this little like Japanese izakaya and, you know, had a couple, couple drinks and he sat him down. He's like, all right, this album thing is going through. Like, they're gonna pay you guys, you know, for to do an album. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. Like, but my guys are all in Beijing, and I'm, you know, and Alex went back to, you know, my sax player went back to New York, and I'm here in Taiwan. I have no clue when I'm gonna be able to get back to Beijing. And he was like, well, you know, you have this the skill set that, you know, that not a lot of people do have which is like being able to work with pro tools and you have access to derek sebnio who is my co-producer who was uh, another guitar player in um in, in both of those bands the Alin band and the karen mock band at the time oh He's like, i see derek mm -hmm. is like one of the top producers and young producers in asia and he's worked with everybody you know and 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 i was like well well let's let me see and he was like well really what i want you to do is just Universal is basically going to pay you to make the album that you always wanted to make. Um, nice. <laughs> and I was like, damn. <laughs> Dude, that's so amazing. I, I, I called Derek up the next day. And, but I mean, 
by pay, I mean, it's like, they're going to pay for all the costs, right. right? Like you spend what you want, but then you, you know, everything else comes back. Um, whatever you spend comes back to you. Mm-hmm. So I, I called Derek the next day. Um, and I asked him, I was like, Hey man, like arise, like giving me this opportunity to do an album. And I was wondering if you'd be interested in, in being on board. And, and at first he was like, yeah, yeah. Like send me everything. You know, it's an instrumental album. I, I got the sense that maybe it was like, uh, like ugh, instrumental albums. Like what can I do to help an instrumental album? Cause he's a, he's a pop producer, right? I sent him one of the, the tracks, Sugoi smash. And he was like, all right, I know what to do with this. He was like, you know, come over, come over tomorrow. Let's get started. Nice. So we did. And like for, from like, March, late March until, or mid March until, you know, end of September. Like I would go over like once a week, once or twice a week, and just sit there like tweaking shit, you know, in, in Pro Tools. And I would write a new section and I'd send it to him and be like, oh man, like what can we add with this? And like, oh, wow. you know, sonically preparing the music for like, you know, for what we knew was eventually going to have to be sent out to everybody to record and then send back. Um, and that's, that's, that's the big thing about this album. It's like, you can't really do it. If you don't, if you can't be technically exact about everything, like I, all of the tempo changes, like in the strings and the beginning of bittersweet, like I actually programmed that, like drew it in with the click. So all the strings players like following along. It's like really like bizarre, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. They, they're marvelous. At it. They're all commercial players too. Like Leah from, from the orchard quartet is a, a colleague of mine uh, from Oberlin. She was a cello player, cello mm-hmm. major at Oberlin. And uh, now she's like, I mean, they're all like monster cello players you know, monster strings players in the, in the film and pop industry. Like they, the Orchard Quartet tours with Panic at the Disco and like, Oh, wow. uh, uh, Molly Rogers is like in Hans Zimmer's like personal group. Um, and they're all like, you know, <laughs> yeah, they're really just good. like, they're, really they're good. beasts, you know? <laughs> yeah. It um, sounded really great for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, Everybody, you know, that, that kind of was the impetus to get it all together or for, you know, for, for me to like really create something that was more produced, which is like, because I needed to be more exact about it. I figured why not just go the extra mile and create something that is going to act not only like not live, but it's actually quite difficult to play live, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, without an extensive amount of like technology behind us. Um, so that, that's really where this, the concept for this album came, which is like, do something totally impossible to play, like on a live setting. <laughs> Perfect, man. <That's> Perfect. <laughs> no, man, I think, uh, you know, for what I've listened myself, the album, you know, I, I really got to check it out. The whole thing, uh-huh. you know, Peter has shared a couple tracks with me. And it's just man, it's it's flawless. Yeah. It's real. It's really cool. Thank it's you. A, it sounds like what you what you're mentioning. You know, it sounds like you took your time and you really knew what you wanted. You know, and it's uh, it, 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 and it's interesting how you did this and probably worked out because also because of the, the pandemic situation, right? Like you said, some people yeah. w- went back home and stuff, and you, you just wow, it's a it's very interesting how you look. Yeah. You use that and turn it around into something so right. cool as like what this album sounds like. And it really shows all your skills as a producer, man. And, uh, you know, thank you and everything. So yeah, thanks for the, <laughs> thanks for the music, man. Wow. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank yeah. you guys for listening. I mean, it's, you know, I, I have a feeling that, I mean, I, not, I have a feeling, I already know that it's, it's, the people who I've gotten the most like vehement criticism about are all like jazz purists, mm. right? Guys like really like to like record the, like the idea of a live album is an album, of course, right? right? That is the album. So like I've had some, you know, 
fairly vehement like critics like come to me like this is not jazz you know like mm, blah yeah. blah blah i'm like man you know all right that's but that i didn't want i didn't want to do a jazz album but, mm. but I'm, I'm really i'm really happy that you know obviously there is a shared language among everybody who played the album which is that they all are like jazz musicians to a greater or lesser extent you know yep um and they have a background in you know black music or you know playing that out of that tradition um that improvisatory music tradition and you know the music that we're doing on the album is 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 very reflective of that but also reflective of a lot of different cultures i mean really what it is is just all of the the stuff that i wanted to do as i wanted to play as a kid like <laughs> that's really like what it is um, yeah yeah it so you, comes you're out. really taking like a journey through the musical like childhood uh here um but yeah like the way it was produced mixed and mastered is is very yeah anti-purist <laughs> it, it, it really like it, it's not a it's not a purist friendly album at yeah all. I, I know one of the terms that you often use is uh death bop i'm not too, is that what you use <laughs> yeah yeah death bop. <laughs> yeah i see that term being floated around i'm like what's yeah. death bop <laughs> well you know it, it's, it's the thing is like i i don't i never knew what to call our music like it's it's like it's like <laughs> Say like postmodern like dance jazz instrumental covers is like way more of a mouthful and more confusing than just like coming up with something like really random altogether that actually makes people interested in like potentially interested in what we're playing. So like if I said like postmodern like electronic like jazz dance cover song, it just yeah, doesn't I'm confused. Doesn't have to say ring. Right. So I was like, eh, we're playing like some of the guys are like still playing their bebop lines on on like right. you know yeah yeah they are Monday <laughs> song so like why not call it something like crazy like you know because like the brecker brothers when they did their band they called theirs heavy metal bebop right um really heavy that, that album <laughs> heavy metal bebop yeah so i was like oh death bop that's like a natural extension of of, of like <laughs> yeah like death metal right and then <laughs> yeah, yeah death bop death. <laughs> i love it man yeah <laughs> It's hilarious, man. I don't know. But it, it was like a really like, fucking joke at the beginning, but it kind of st- stuck because we started using the hashtag, and then you know, yeah, it just hasn't taken off yet, but maybe it will. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it definitely, um, yeah, separates. It definitely does intrigue the the listener. Be like, what is death bop? like what does that even sound like you know Um, right right. but no i I mean i definitely suggest anyone listening to this podcast that they check out this album what what was the exact name of the album that the album is called the adventures of pie boy adventures of pie boy Um, in chinese is pie it's i and and what is the meaning of of that well okay so this kind of ties back to like my commercial music career which is that um I used to spend, you know, three or four months out of the year in, in Changsha and Hunan. And um, we would stay at this, you know, film, when we were filming these TV shows, we would stay at this one hotel called the Mincheng Guoji Fan Dian, an international hotel. And, uh, you know, we, we're really busy, like, so we don't have that much time to like, go out and find things to eat. Mm-hmm. So we just go downstairs to the 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 restaurant the chinese restaurant on the first floor like near the lobby and eat there and the food is actually pretty good like the first month <laughs> same <laughs> shit like month that day after day it's like oh my god but then one day i was like looking you know and for the foreigners like they would have these little like barcode scanners on on the placards and you could scan whatever thing that you wanted there's a picture of it there and you mm. can scan whatever you want there's a title and a price and everything and you get a daily allowance, like go buy food and stuff. Mm. So oh. one day I was like scanning stuff and then I saw a placard that I hadn't seen before. And the placard was like this like generic looking like pork dish. And it but the the Chinese was called Pai Pai Zai Yu which literally translates to and and they have an English translation beneath it, which just like blew my mind how awesome it was. It's 
the translation is pie boy moon bone. Um, <laughs> and, and I was like, man, that's, that's such a crazy sounding thing. Like pie boy moon bone. It could be like some super mysterious, like, you know, <laughs> martial arts, like legend, you know, or something yeah. like that. So I was like, I'm going to write a song called pie boy. Moon bone. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's what I did. Like I wrote, I, the, there's a tune on the album called pie boy moon bone. And it has this kind of like, martial arts kind of kung fu chop suey vibe to it um and i made it one of the singles off the album and then and i kind of figured like well like okay the album is like this kind of thing where i want it to be well all right so let me let me back up and say like one of the, one of the songs one of the albums that i had that had influenced me influenced me the most as a kid was was sergeant peppers mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Yeah, the Beatles album, yes. and I, I I loved the way that everything runs together. Um, and to me, I always wanted to make instrumental Sergeant Peppers. So, <laughs> right, it was something that I felt like it's not, you know, I, I I want there to be a running theme throughout this, throughout this album, and so I thought like, well. What if, like, people are naturally going to ask, like, who is Pie Boy? Pie Boy Moonbo, right? So I figured, like, why not make the album about Pie Boy and call it, instead of the album Pie Boy Moonbo, I'll make it like <clears throat> like a musical adventure. Mm. And so I decided to go with the adventures of Pie Boy. And then the, the fourth song of the album is... Pipe of Moonbow. Mm. Ah, oh. gotcha. Gotcha. Nice. Yeah. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Always starts with food. That's why I noticed. That. Always, always food, right? <laughs> <laughs> there were so many like silly placards in that, like in that hotel. Once I started noticing them, they were really funny. Like there's this seaweed pork bone soup. And it you know, the the Chinese name is something like, you know, Hai Dai Tong Zai Gu Tang. Which literally is just seaweed and pork bone soup, but like whatever translator medium they software they put it through <laughs> came out with a large bowl of scum. Oh right? a large bowl of scum. Right. Oh no. <laughs> and then and then like one of them is like pi dan, pi dan, or like xiao pi dan, like little, you know, little the thousand year old eggs. And oh, the translation okay. is a little skin, a little egg. Oh my God. <laughs> they were definitely messing with the people there there's yeah there's no... totally it's pretty awesome <laughs> so you know that it's just like inspiration for these things can come from like really random places like oh yeah some sign you know? they, there was one in Chengdu that <laughs> i really wanted always wanted to write a song about this it, it definitely you know it's definitely something like that might that sounds like you know I'm not going to name any names, but you know the, the 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 translation of the you know we were walking through the panda uh, exhibit, like you know looking yeah. at pandas, and there's like this path, and it demarks you know it demarcates the path to walk to to the first panda exhibit, and the sign was like translated as like the way to visit pandas, and I remember like. <laughs> versus like the incorrect way to visit pandas like what you know so i was like the way to visit pandas like sounds like a really like kind of just bizarre like you yeah know. it's like a spiritual way of thinking about yeah. pandas yeah spiritual <laughs> panda exhibit so like that's another one that would be awesome the way to visit pandas the way to visit. <laughs> that's freaking hilarious man well i you know that's <laughs> That's uh really appreciate it. And um I had I had the privilege of um, you know, editing the video for Bittersweet, which was really um, you know, I was it was really and, fun to and, do. You know. And thank you so much for that, man. Like I know I threw that on you like last minute. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I think it was like a two day window or something like that. I know, you know I know. Like, can like, you include oh, yeah, can you include all of these um, you know, uh, in, uh video footage of like our past performances too? And and oh by the way, here's here's 30 of them. 
know? <laughs> <laughs> There's 30 guys all, all doing, you know, working together. But man, it, it really yeah. turned out great. Like, yeah. And thank you for like, you know, busting, busting ass to get that one together. Yeah, yeah, it's no problem. I'm really glad, you know, I hope people enjoy it, you know, for sure. And yeah. Yeah. Still waiting for the Vivo. God. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm assuming that they probably a take their time and b have regulations yeah. they probably need to uh right. go through in order to make things happen so you know those yeah. things usually you don't see <laughs> fruition of of those larger unless entities. you're on a grande right. yeah unless, <laughs> that's pretty immediate yeah right. um totally understand. what ari wants ari gets <laughs> <laughs> uh what where, where can people um check out the music mm. um well, they're or buy mostly album, mine. Uh, <laughs> we don't have physical copies because they're quite expensive to produce um, these days because we have to do them through Universal. Um, but uh, you can find it on Spotify. Uh, you can find it on uh, Apple Music. iTunes should be out soon. Um, the, but all the other platforms too, like Tidal, yeah. if you want like master quality audio, we gave... We gave the, uh, okay, the, the master title. quality rips to everybody there. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Amazon Music, Deezer. They're on YouTube as well. Yeah. What about Bandcamp? And, um, Bandcamp. Yes. Bandcamp. They are up on Bandcamp. I have to be careful about that because Bandcamp was, I, I, I originally wanted, I, technically I'm not supposed to put it on Bandcamp. I, I was about to say. <laughs> yeah. But I got, basically got permission from um, Elevens because uh it was too slow to get the embeds up for all the 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 previews the, the premieres and the reviews that we were doing so oh understand I yeah understand. it's okay. it's all good though i mean like you know it's there this album doesn't go platinum, <laughs> i think universal will be fine unless anybody from universal is listening to this then you know. yeah they're specifically hunting <laughs> you down on jazz biz 101 right. let it be let it be known yeah. let it be on My the record james from universal <laughs> maybe listen yeah. <laughs> yeah. um yeah yeah man so yeah thank you so much for for doing this wow, today yeah. you know Terrence, uh, well, thank you guys for having me yeah talked a lot <laughs> no, 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 I, I think that's the purpose of podcasts, exactly. right? Yeah. Talk, yeah. No, thanks um, for sharing there... the stories that you share with us, man. And no in, problem. Inside man. of how, like, it's amazing still, like, to me to think uh, how you move from, like, you know, from the states to to China and like really just got in there and, and all the good things that you're doing out there with your career. So, wish you much Thank success, you, man. man. Keep continuing the success Thank you. and everything. For sure. Uh, same to you guys. Yep. Yeah, yeah it's, yeah, it's great to see you guys like doing podcasts and, you know, also Peter for like getting all these initiatives together and, and doing the video yeah. thing. Pivoting that into that is looks like it's, it's paid off really well. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if it paid off really well, but it it, it paid. <laughs> it's paying. <laughs> it's just pay right that's now. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. right, exactly. Yeah, that's right. That's That's like really, really, I guess if I would close by saying anything, it's. I'm going to take a pot shot right here. Um, not at you guys, but at, you know, it's, this is a jazz business blog. And I mm-hmm. think that one of the things that I am very grateful that I didn't piece, one of the pieces of advice that I, I I'm grateful I didn't follow is this idea that you have to invest all of your time and money in like the craft. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean that like spiritually you shouldn't invest in your craft, but that I think that this ideology, this idea that we should like leave nothing, you know, behind for a rainy day is, has kind of been, was something that I felt very heavily coming out of school and going into music was like, oh, the music will take care of you. Like just spend every penny you have on mm. you know doing your big band album or whatever you know i know guys who like they, they made a big game they turned around they like spent it on a big band album now they're like you know they're they're out on the street you know and, and it's i'm really thankful that I, I i i had a little bit of financial literacy to be able to say that that wasn't a smart idea for myself mm-hmm. and to, to save a little bit of money which i think 
you know, has allowed me to continue to live a fairly normal lifestyle here in Taiwan. Yeah. Um, and, and I, and I, I really hope that, you know, for jazz musicians in the future, like we can learn how to invest in a healthy way in our art, but also like mm. really find a balance as well uh, between, you know, our livelihoods and our future and as well as, our, as the art that we kind of, you know, have at the forefront of our minds. That's right. Man, that's a beautiful statement yeah, right man. there. Yeah, that's exactly um, you know what we're trying to to get at for sure. The, mm. the literacy, right? The business right. literacy of of this music, you know, right? And like understanding what you know, uh, whether this investment is <laughs> something that's actually uh, going to benefit you or you know something that's just going to crash to the ground, you know. Yeah. And, right. You know, we definitely want to. I mean, know, spread it's that it's tough, man, because you got all these like old guys you know, who are telling you, like, I didn't save anything. Like, I just made my gig money and my recording session money. And that's, and I just like played 16 hours a day or whatever, you know, and, and just turned into, you know, the best musician I could be. And, and that worked, you know, in the 1950s and 60s, and maybe even a little bit later than that. But in today's modern age, you know, it's very hard to survive doing that and a lot of people either burn out or you know that's true when the the when the the black swan scenario comes i.e the pandemic mm. like how are we supposed to survive when we're already scraping so close you know to the bottom truth truth that's hard man it's really hard yeah uh, yeah yeah i can't even think about uh you know i can't even imagine how many people that you know great performers that probably are not playing and that completely you know stop playing their instrument because they had to get another job and stuff like that right and, yeah. and it's cool you got to do what you got to do you know but it's I, I i appreciate i think we appreciate all your insight on that and your opinion on really just taking care of business too as a, a way to build yeah. your career right so Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess the other thing I would say is that for me, I've always followed people, not opportunities. Mm. Right. Like, particularly like the MD thing, that's kind of what I was getting at was like, you, you, you follow an MD because there's somebody you trust. And like, not only does that person have to, like, if it's an MD you trust, you have to trust them because that person is not only going to be like the guy who pays you, but he's also the guy who's promoting you to the management, like to the artist. Oh yeah. You know, if somebody mm. says like, oh, right. like, why is the, you know, why is the trumpet or the trombone a little bit out of tune? And, you know, he'll be, he'll have to be the one to be like, no, nah, they're not actually out of tune. Like it's just the way the program is set up. Like you're maybe the trombone can be down a little bit more. I mean, the, residual frequencies mm -hmm. of course if you are out of tune then he will tell you out of tune right, right. <laughs> but but they're, they're, not, right. they're also just like advocates right like right that your your brand is like very much dependent on on them too so finding the right person to follow uh is to me like way more important than finding the right opportunity that's right um because opportunity will often find you if you're ready you'll you'll get it and the person, but, but the person who gives you that opportunity, like knowing what their motivations are, uh, that's, that's more determinant of your like success than say, like having access to every opportunity you can get. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's for true. sure. Good stuff, man. Yeah, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Terrence, you. <laughs> uh, again, thanks so much for being on the show, man. And for sharing your insight. Yeah. You know, yeah, we're man. excited to put this out uh, soon enough. Thank you. And uh, to, you Thank know, you. get thousands and millions of uh, streams. And <laughs> get, yes. Get tens of dollars out of. Tens of dollars. <laughs> A buck 40. That's why we do this, right? Spotify. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All, um, this, all this financial literacy. In oh, yeah. The end. It's, we don't know what we're going <laughs> to do with so much. Right. So still a, a 
a pithy. What are they? <laughs> this is the the Wolf the Wolf Peck guys. Like, what's his name? Was it Theo? It's not. It's not Theo. It's the front man. Uh, anyways, he he went on CNN and he was like, like there's pennies, and then I call them pithies, which are like literally like a hundredth of a penny, oh. and that's how much like <laughs> one one like play on Spotify is worth. So like, you get one pithy for like. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for playing. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> oh lord well on that note thank you everyone for yeah, listening, thanks for listening. <laughs> all right we enjoy your pithies yeah. <laughs> enjoy your- thanks give us all your pity. if you like what you heard make sure to follow him on social media we included all the links in our description if you want to follow Yarbrough Entertainment to see what we're up to and maybe some of the virtual concerts coming up, be sure to subscribe to us on our website, www.yarbroughent.com. 